All right, everyone, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and get started. Um, I gave everybody a couple extra minutes because church got out late, get coffee and donuts, all that kind of thing. But, um, and those of you, I think we've got a couple of folks on Zoom making sure that you can hear me. Um, I think everything's set, ready to go. But <clears throat> again, we're just going through the, the different pieces of, of worship again. Most of you have been here at least one week. But the idea basically is that we're looking at worship in terms of how the different pieces of worship, how what we do, what we why we do what we do in terms of it telling the story about Jesus. So each week we're looking at a key piece of worship, a little bit about what it is, why we do it, um, scriptural basis for it, but really getting also then beyond just worship, but how does it inform you know our day-to-day -day lives in terms of the things that we're doing? Um Brief on this again too, but just you know, really, really shortened version of of God's story for us. But that His Word brings forth life. You know, obviously Adam and Eve fall into sin, which then Jesus is coming to save us. The story of Jesus coming to save us, to reconcile us, the faith that He gives us, um, that He sustains us, and He calls us to live a life of faith. And part of that living of life of faith is is coming to worship uh, Him, and the ways that we come to come to worship Him. So this week we're going to be looking at creeds. You know, we, every week we say the creeds in church. Every week we talk about the things that we believe and we confess. Um, but again, so for me, and again, the idea of, of a key word to take away from this each week, but confession, and in this sense, a confession of faith, not a confession of sins, but a confession of faith as a part of God's story. Examples, when we look in the Bible, we can see where folks are confessing, confessing their faith. Confession that we do in worship, again, confession of faith, and then confession of faith in our daily lives. <clears throat> So I'm going to go ahead and just dive into this a little bit. I've got a, a few uh, scripture passages up here. And um, yes, yeah, Stu, go ahead. Oh, to move that. I'm sorry. Maybe. Sorry, I didn't realize it was on that side. Nope. Let me see if I can redo this here in just a second. Sorry. My my technological savviness. If I can find the pieces I need. <laughs> mm -mm 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 -mm. Where is the zoo piece that I want? 150 years ago, pastors had to know how to ride a horse to get from Paris to Paris, right? <laughs> now they need to know how to use computers. It's still there. Can you just slide my, it to the other corner? The weird, thing is, the weird thing is, the weird thing is, I don't click see it on. Click on the small part. I know, but I don't see it on the screen here. That's the that's the weird thing that's going on. I'm not sure what I'm doing. Okay, sorry. Yeah, but it, it's it's not here for some reason. It's a weird thing. I'm not sure what it's doing. And I'm not going to restart it. So forgive forgive me that I'm forgive me that I'm covering up some of my words. Um, okay. So anyway, um, I'm just going to highlight a few examples uh, from God's word in terms of folks making confessions of faith. Um, Matthew 16 here. Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon repeated, replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered him, this is where you get into the whole, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. John 6 is the spot where you have Peter. Um, <clears throat> Peter, again, this is uh, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. The idea of confession of faith here is, again, that the fact that these are things that are on people's lips. These are things that come out of their mouth that are expressions of their faith, expressions of their trust in who Jesus is. Um, revelation, in both instances, this is part of John's revelation and getting that glimpse into heaven. And I believe in both of these instances, in Revelations 4 and 5, there's at least parts of this that come from Isaiah. But um, in Revelations 4, you're looking around the throne, on each side of the throne, the four living creatures full of eyes in front, 
The four leaving creatures, each of them with six wings are full of eyes all around within the day, day and night. They never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of God Almighty who is and is to come. Worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Again, things coming out of folks' mouths being confessions about recognition of who God is, uh, what he's done for us, what he deserves. Um, Revelation 5, again, to um, <clears throat> this is who is who is worthy to, to open the scroll. And they sing, this is the four living creatures again, saying a song, worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain by your blood, ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language, every people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And again, just the fact that here you've got angels, the four living creatures, confessing the fact of who Jesus is. He's the one that was slain by his blood. He's redeemed his ransom, ransom and has made us, made us good. Questions any of that? I want to dive into the worship pieces because I think I, I'm actually really excited about this to see what, what people have to say about the creeds because it's one of those things we say every week, but um, it's a pretty profound thing, I think. So questions on any of this? Comments quickly or not quickly, frankly. We can take time too. All right. So again, when we get into confession, confession of faith and worship, you know, what are they, what do they, what do they say about them? But I think even more importantly, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, you know, the fact that confession of faith is an act of faith, you know, that whole idea of, of sacrificial versus sacramental uh, in worship. And again, to, to, re, to refresh our minds about that, sacramental is anything in worship where God's bestowing gifts upon us. And sacrificial then is, is our response to faith to those gifts God's given us to give him honor, to give him glory, to give him praise, to come to him in prayer. You know, and so when we're, we're at the, the spot of the creeds in worship, you've already been in the, the sacrificial position of confessing your sins before God and sacramentally you've received that forgiveness. You've been in a position to sing praises to God and hymns. You've been in a position to, to say the Kyrie, to pray before God. Um, but then you're also receiving the gifts of knowing that he answers your prayer. And then just the fact that last week we talked about the word of God and the proclamation of the word, that you've heard God's word. You've heard the truth of who he is, both in his written word, but also in the proclamation of his word in the sermon. And then the confession comes, typically right after the sermon. Sometimes we do it before the sermon, you know, but most, most of the times it's, it's right after the sermon. It's how we just did it at 8 o'clock this morning. So this, this confession of our faith, this reciting the words of the Apostles' Creed is what we said this morning, is a response to what you've just heard in the word of God. It's a response to what you've just heard in the proclamation. It's a response of your faith of knowing this is who Jesus is. Here's your chance to say what you really believe. Um, I've got a comment from Luther here about this. This comes from the large catechism from the Ten Commandments. So this is, again, thinking about why we do this, confessing this out loud with our, with our mouths. On the other hand, one must urge and encourage all it again and again to honor God's name and to keep it constantly upon their lips in all circumstances and experiences. For the proper way to honor God's name is to look to it for all consolation and therefore call upon it. Thus, as we have heard, first, our, our heart honors God with our faith. So we have the faith that he's given us. We have the faith that we've been reminded of in the proclamation of God's words and the ways that he comes to us in worship to receive those promises. But First, the heart honors God by faith, but then the lips by confession. So my, my question for you, and I, I've got more that we can go through with all this, but my question for you to kind of think about, and I'm curious what everybody says, and, and, and for me is, is preparing this stuff this week of just thinking about the fact of, of how profound and awesome this is that, frankly, I don't give enough credit to sometimes to get up there and say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker, creator of heaven and earth. Jesus Christ is only son. We kind of, kind of fly through all the words and what those are. But this is a response to the faith that he's given us. This is a response of us living out our faith to say, here is the rock on which we stand. You know, again, quoting the idea of Peter, the confession of understanding to be able to say with our mouths the faith that we have and who Jesus is and who God is. So as we think through, let's just say the Apostles' Creed. What are those, what are those parts that we blow through a little bit and just say really quickly that if you take a moment, think about that are, that are really profound for you. If you really think about what we are really saying and not just the sense of, and, and maybe you're better than me, maybe you don't blow through them and you are really thinking about them, but if you're really thinking about them, share a little bit about which parts of those three articles that really 
resonate with you when you're thinking about the the wonder and the joy of the faith that God's given you and the chance that that we come together as a people of a body of believers and Sam every week in worship. We used to have hanging next to the <clears throat> altar area up there, which came from the old church. Mm-hmm. A way to visualize it, too. I don't, when we're in church saying the Apostles' Creed, I don't do this, but at home, I like to, in my, um, I'm there by myself, so I'm not talking. I mean, and I'm saying it in my mind, the meaning from Luther's small catechism mm -hmm. of each article, because that really, really brings out what it is. The one that pops in my head is that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in, believe in Jesus Christ, Christ, come to faith in him. Yep. That's from the third article, I believe, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The recognition that we're saying we believe all this, but again, it's it's all a gift that he's given us, the faith that he's given us, and even the ability to be able to say it out loud and, and think about what it means as we say it out yeah. loud. Yeah. I think saying it out loud is really important in a church. I think it's really important for us to say it out loud, just like praying out loud is important. <clears throat> One thing that I think is interesting, and we don't talk about it a lot, the Lord says he descended into hell. I mean, we talk about him rising on the third day, but we don't have to really go into that part of it too much. I think that's kind of interesting. We don't talk about that a lot. Yeah. And I don't think people really realize sometimes that that's even there, because you can talk about that in the Bible study. I think well, Oh, really? Mm -hmm. It's not in the Nicene Creed, I don't think. No, it's not in the Nicene, no, but it's in the Apostles' <laughs> Creed. And while, <clears throat> I don't know if you remember this, but a while back when we first decided to go to communion all services, mm -hmm. we do the Nicene communion, the Apostles' non communion. So I was asking Pastor Will what happens to the Apostles' Creed. And, and he, um, I didn't want to pursue it because we were he was before this guy for church so it was over time. But he gave a name to the Nicene Creed, like what kind of creed it was. So I wonder if you can remember that, expand on that. I mean, the <clears throat> I was there briefly for that conversation. I don't remember the exact details of what he said. Um and Bob, you can happy to weigh in if you have thoughts on this too, but the way I've always understood it was that. The Apostles' Creed has always historically been more associated with baptism. It's always been more associated with just regular worship stuff. And Nicene Creed has always been associated when you're doing uh, communion or for feast or festival days, things like that. More of more of the kind of high church kind of days, whether it's Pentecost or Christmas or things like that, um, where, where you where you say those. And and I don't know that I don't again. I, I mean, I read about this briefly, but I'm not as well studied on this as I probably could be to know the exact reasons historically about how those patterns got established um you know you'd, you'd be talking after fourth century because nicene creed comes into place and council of nicaea which is 386 or something like that i believe you know so into the fourth century um but yeah feel free to weigh in if you know any of the history of this oh, stuff I, or, I, yeah, or that, I, that I, I don't but you use the word the pattern and i think that's it's good to remember that's simply a pattern that, that has been used for a long time um, my thought is that the, the Nicene Creed, <clears throat> again, is traditionally used uh, in connection with the celebration of the sacrament, largely because of the beginning part of the second article. You know, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. Uh, oh, no, some of my <laughs> memory is going to go on me. God of God, God of God, light of light, true God, and very, very God of very God. Begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation. And it's that it's that it lifts up, and that and that has to do with the history of 
that was the, the creeds were largely developed out of a defense of the faith against a misunderstanding. And um, was it the Arians? Arians, yes, yeah. And the Arians denied the divinity of Christ. And so the, the Nicene Creed was, was developed as a, as a defense of the faith um, against the Arians. And so it lifts up that whole true God of true God. You know, uh, and since that's so much inherent in the sacrament, that it is true, but true God and true man who gives us his body, et cetera, et cetera, that the Nicene Creed became attached to. What's, what's also interesting is there are many other creeds. We focus on three of them, yep. maybe two of them. <laughs> two, two of them, really. Three, yeah, three. three we, we hope we miss church on Trinity Sunday. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> then you don't get away with a long sermon, Dan. <laughs> no, probably not. But... The creed is long enough. You know? <laughs> um, but uh, and those of you who know the Athanasian Creed, you're laughing because you, the others of you aren't don't understand the word I just said. But, um, they're not one God, but th not three yeah, gods, but one just, God. It's and, just, yeah. it's, it, you know. and, and really, you know, my understanding too, both the Nicene and the Athanasian came around about the same time again, you know, oh, fourth so. century, because Athanasius actually did work that led to some of the work on both of them. Um, and again, it's, it was a response to redefend the faith against some of the heresies that were going on, specifically Arianism and the divine, divine divinity of Christ. Um, <clears throat> So the Apostles' Creed is older? The Apostles' oh, yeah. Creed is yeah. much older, yes. Hence, I mean, that's part of the name, too. You're going back to, you know, something that would have been happening very much, as far as we can tell, very very often in the very early church. So, But that probably ought to be explained, too. I mean, a lot of people think the Apostles' Creed is called that because it was written by the Apostles. It is not. Uh, it is it is a, a summary of the, of the teachings of the Apostles as drawn from the New Testament. Some have gone to the point... If you go through the Apostles' Creed, it nicely breaks down into 12 statements. Yep. 12 statements. Each apostle wrote, well, nah, that's, that's, you know, it's just a nice way of remembering it. But um, yeah, it's just named for the apostles. It was not written by the apostles. The Nicene Creed is, is named because of the council that approved it. And the Athanasian Creed is written in honor of the man who did not write it. <laughs> but did a lot of work that led he to it. He did a lot of work on it, but he did not write the Athanasian Creed, but he's given that honor. I think when we're looking at this too, and especially um, you know, getting to even your point of the importance of, of saying it all together, you know, and, and, and I think it's it, for me, it's kind of two different points, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pull out, you know stuff from our uh, confessions again too, because I think there's some really really good things that Luther and Melanchthon and others that have written on this that really highlight the importance of this act of not just having your faith in your heart, but faith on your lips of confessing who God is. Um, <clears throat> the first, actually, interestingly enough, comes from the treatise and the, on the power and primacy of the Pope, but um, I think it's really good words that that highlight this, and it's that distinction when you look at you know Jesus talking to Peter and the whole idea of on this rock, I'll build my church. Um, and it's granted that it was said, on this rock, I'll build my church. But certainly the church is not a build upon the authority of a human being, upon Peter. He's not talking about Peter, but upon the ministry of the confession that Peter made. The church is built upon the confession of faith, of, under, of, of that expression of faith that people have. So it's, it's built upon the ministry of that confession that Peter made, in which he proclaimed Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of God, for that reason, Christ addresses him as the minister on this rock, that is, on this ministry. Furthermore, the ministry of the New Testament is not bound to places or persons, as in, like, the Levitical ministry, or that it had to be happening in Jerusalem with the Old Testament with the Israelites, but it's scattered throughout the whole world and exists wherever God gives, gives his gifts, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and that ministry is not valid because of the authority of the people that are doing it, but it's valid because of the word handed down by Christ and the fact that you then exceed the expression of that word and the fact the way that people are confessing who God is and the truth, first and foremost, the fundamentally of that Jesus Christ is our Savior. So I, I love that from the standpoint of part of the reason that we say it all together is because it's so fundamental to what, who we are as a church. It's so fundamental from the standpoint of, of this expression of our faith to say this is what we believe. We know that Jesus is the is true God and true man. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you ever want, if somebody ever asks you to, to summarize the Bible, 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker. I mean, it's it's right there. That's the the word, you know. It's just it's a good tea up. So this next one, this is Formula Concord, solid declaration. And I love this stuff. So tell me if I don't know how many of you read your book of Concord very often, but but oh, one of those nerdy confessions. <laughs> ah, fair enough. I'm sorry. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. But it gets to this idea of a general summary. So it says fundamentally enduring unity in the church requires above all that we have a clear and binding summary and form in which a general summary of teaching is drawn together from God's word to which then the churches, we can hold the true and Christian religion and confess our, our adherence to what that is. So for the same purpose, the ancient church always had its reliable creeds, which are not based upon private writings, but upon such books that were set forth the canonical works of the Old and New Testament, approved and accepted in the name of the churches that confess their adherence to a single teaching of religion. For this reason, we have made this mutual declaration with hearts and mouths that we intend to create, accept no special or new confession of faith. I mean, the fact that these have been around for so long, I mean, it hasn't changed. The work that Jesus did on the cross has not changed. The work that God did to create the heavens and the earth, work, earth has not changed. The work that the Holy Spirit does and when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit baptism, that he draws us all together <clears throat> in sanctity and truth and unity by his work to, as a body of believers, Christ hasn't changed. So there's no reason for the creeds to change. But again, it becomes such a fundamental part of our identity as Christians, our identity as brothers and sisters in Christ to come together and say, here's what we know. Here's what we confess that we believe about, again, who God is and who Jesus is. Yeah. You know I've attended worship at numerous non denominational Christian churches, <clears throat> but I don't ever remember hearing any creeds there. Any no. honestly ever said that. Mm -hmm. but, but why not? I mean, if you said it, it's, it's, you know, centuries old in our belief in Christianity, well, if they proclaim to be Christian, is it because some of the references, like you somebody mentioned about baptism, some, I mean, I just don't understand it. And the other thing I never hear um, is the Our Father. Like mm -hmm. I have four grandchildren that go to an, the Berean Church, and none of them know the Our Father. You know, it just it's just not said, and I don't understand why. I heard a guy. Um, from the I, I mean, the evangelical churches this week say, uh, well, let's pray. We're going to pray from our heart. And I think that's what they, they think is that when you start praying these prayers over and over again, and you got it memorized, how many times have we gone through our father and gone, oh, it's over there. Yep. What did I say? Yeah. Right. You know, so they have the idea. And I've sat in evangelical churches too, and they don't pray those prayers. They don't know. I mean, the kids don't know when you write out of Adults do, but I do think they try to pray from their heart. That's what their idea is. I'm not condoning that. I just heard a guy say that this week, and I do believe that. My, my thought is, my thought too is on that same note, but is that whether they don't like the idea of living in a pattern that doesn't allow for as much flexibility, flexibility to say what I want to say this week, that might and and part of this kind of. There, there's this there's this movement of kind of deconstructionism going on right now in American society and deconstructionism really, really shortly speaking is I'm going to take all these beliefs, you know, something like a creed that I was raised in <clears throat> and tear it down to really find out what I think I actually believe and then build something back up into just the pieces that really make sense for me. And so instead of saying God's word is this and it tells me who I am in Christ or it tells me the sinner that I am, or, tell, or, or even looking at like a creed and saying, here's the creed and here's the things that we actually believe. I'd much rather be able to pick and choose the things that make sense for me that I believe, whether or not they all are in the creed or not. So by not saying the creed, it gives more space for this whole, whole idea of an individualized faith experience that you maybe don't all believe the same thing. Bob, were you going to, yeah. I think that individualized thing is real important to them to uh, say that. I don't, that they have decided to mm -hmm. be a Christian, mm -hmm. not that God has chosen them. Yep. It's, it's the other way around. And, and even table prayers, they, you know, the come Lord Jesus, 
oh no, because that's just rote and we're not really thinking. So they pray there from the heart. Mm -hmm. Yep. Prayer, which is basically the same words anyway. I mean, they say the same basic words. Yeah. Well, I didn't grow up in a Lutheran church. <laughs> and I like a lot of what we talk about here. You know, God chooses you. And I believe that it's all true. And I believe a lot of the things. I believe everything in the church. But growing up, not Lutheran, it's kind of these things like we follow the Bible, not what someone else wrote. I think that's their belief. I don't think it's that they, I, I do think that it does leave room for an individual to feel things differently or see things differently. And I think that's one of the reasons you go to church is so that you can kind of like be refocused and you can kind of like feel around other believers to like make sure that you yourself are not visualizing <coughs> like God intended. But I don't think they, I don't think to talk about them as like a they and a, they get to do what they want to them. They get to see how they do it. It's like, I think their belief is that they are following the Bible and nothing else. Right. I agree. But there is room to interpret the Bible differently, obviously. And so I think that there's some failure in that. And I think the Lutheran Church definitely helps people stay, of course, like less spongy away from the Bible, I would say. But I don't think it's like an intent to... I think the hearts are like, we believe in the Bible. Yeah. Uh, what you just said, I think an echo. I had a conversation with a man a few years ago. You know, he poo pooed the idea of creed. I said, why? Basically, words of man, the Bible is our creed. And I didn't say it to him at the time, but I thought, I think your church on its webpage has a what we believe section. You know, it's a lot of these churches have a have a, con a confession of creed. It's right on their webpage, even though they won't admit it. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Now, is it, um, you know, we're going to start that deconstruction isn't, that's nothing new. That's been going on for a long, long time. Um, you know, and, and one of the mantras of a lot of the evangelical churches, and I'm not criticizing for this, but they looked at what in their day was the predominant faith, Roman Catholic, Lutheran, Episcopal, those kind of very liturgical churches, and they saw them as, as being dead, mm -hmm. dead in their orthodoxy. They were right, but they were dead. And so the, the mantra came out, give us deeds, not creeds. You know, don't tell me what you believe, show me what you believe. Which is, sounds like a really wonderful statement until you really boil it down and we're, we're really talking about is works righteousness. Because I'm now saved not by what I believe and confess, I'm now saved by what I do. That's nothing less than works righteousness. You know. Um, Even go back to the words of Peter. If you look at Peter, we just talked about him the other night, and Peter denies Christ in the courtyard, or Peter sinks into the water, or Peter says all these, you know, cut chops off a ear, all these. If you look at Peter's deeds, you're not going to be able to save by Peter's deeds, by what he's done. But you know, Christ is saying you'll be saved because he confesses that Jesus is the Christ. My, my assessment of Peter is when you don't know what to say, say something really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I use that in reference to a brother pastor one time at his, at his uh, farewell sermon. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't appreciate that. And the fact that it was my brother-in-law didn't, didn't, especially didn't go over her well. <laughs> Anyway, now, the other way I look at the creed is having heard the word, having been nourished in, in the truth of God's word, God is going to get be getting me ready to go out and share that faith with others. Okay, the creed is my practicing of sharing that faith. I share it within the comfortable circle of, of fellow believers, but it, it helps me put into into a, a nice format how I can share that faith with someone else. Now that doesn't mean confessing the creed to them. You know, well, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty. <laughs> But it gives me an outlook. It gives me a, a, a coach. Bullet, bullet points to reference. Yeah. Bullet points to reference. That's yep. a good way to phrase it. I'm not into the bullet points. <laughs> no, I know, but I mean, but no, it is. I mean, and, and, and I think as we talk about this, you know, 
whether you're like me and you're born and raised Lutheran, all that kind of stuff, or Tiffany or Sue or whomever that, you know, weren't, but there's, there's so many different, you know, gradations of, of the types of things that we're going to see outside the Lutheran church or outside LCMS certainly. And, you know, two, two, I think really important things in my mind to keep in mind is that even if they're in a church where they're not saying creeds, or even, you know, Tiffany, what you're describing in terms of your circumstance, if somebody really wanted to be biblical to, you know, to state the obvious, hopefully, but is that there's going to be a lot, a lot of other people that are Lutheran that are non-Lutherans that are going to be in heaven with us because, because they certainly have faith. They certainly confess their belief in him, even if they don't confess the creed in this way. Um, and I think the second part of it, at least, is, is just for us getting into the thought process of this is why we do it. It's important for some of what Pastor Shale just talked about, you know, the practice, the rehearsal, you know, it's a response of faith. It's a, it's a recognition of a common unity of here's where we know where we stand together of what we know about who God the Father is, what we know about who Jesus is, what we know about the Holy Spirit is. And if another church doesn't do that, hopefully God is leading them by the power of his grace and mercy and love to draw people to him in, in a different way. But at least this is why we do it rather than somebody else not doing it is, is, is terrible and atrocious and wrong. Yeah. What I think is really neat is that when you cite the creed together, it's an expression of unity, mm -hmm. a real strong unity. But what was also striking is that we say, I believe, not we believe. And you all know the reason why we say I. But I think that's just incredible that we can say I individually, but yet it's still a statement of unity. Mm -hmm. I had I had one of the congregations that I served. I had them do this one Sunday. They took a day. Asked me, please never do that again. Um, it is a confession of faith, and we, you know, normally we face the altar. I don't need to tell God what I believe. He already knows that. I need to tell you what I believe. And so I had the two sides of the congregation turn and face each other and confess. They said never do that again. <laughs> it was very uncomfortable. Wasn't and wasn't that a practice? Bathroom, wasn't that a practice that was common years ago, though? I don't know. I believe that they used to they used I, to turn I, to I each other. No idea about I, I think I'd read it that. Just, yes. It just struck me. We need to be looking at each other when we say that. Yeah. Um, when well, English yeah. cathedrals, they do that. You kill the slam. I, like when the queen, sorry, prince's funeral in those chapels, they would call. Oh yeah. They, they have the seats. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Partial. Yep. But try that sometime. Just it's, instead of just standing there staring at the altar or reading the screen, you know the creed. Come on, you've said it often enough. You know, start turning around and look at each other. I believe in God. You know, and just try to make eye contact with somebody. It, uh, it it isn't comfortable, but I think it's it's it can be a, a helpful practice. So I always do this. We've got you know seven more minutes, and I got to go down and play in a minute. So we got it. Um, but this whole idea of confession in our daily lives, um, I really like this from First John uh, four. And the point of kind of looking at this here is that when you're walking out in your daily day, daily lives, you know, after Sunday church, Monday through Saturday, and you're you're looking at the world and you're meeting people in the world and whatever it happens to be, um, walking out with that certainty of here's what we've just confessed together that practice to be out in the world to say, I know who God the Father is, I know who Jesus Christ is, I know who the Holy Spirit is. But uh, 1 John 4 <clears throat> is about testing the spirits, testing what you see in the world, testing what you hear from other people when they're potentially confessing their faith to you. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone on into the world. By this you will know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. It actually says this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which he was hers was coming and now is in the world already. And just that degree of binary, even, you know, either or. You're going out into the world ready to confess the faith that you have, confess who you are as a believer in Christ, to know that it fundamentally rests on whether or not you see Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But Jesus Christ is from God. And if somebody says something different, you already know where you're standing with that person. And, and not good or bad, not to stand in judgment, but just to, just to fundamentally be ready and be prepared about what you need to share about what your faith is with where that person's already coming from, at least from what you think you may have heard.
<clears throat> going on in first John though, when you're looking, um, this is, that was verses one to three verses 13 to 15. By this, we know that we abide in him and he, uh, he and us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So again, just that certainty of knowing that by confessing that Jesus is the son of God, the faith that he's given us in our hearts, but we're saying it out of our lips to be in the spot then knowing that God's abiding with us, God's walking with us in those moments. Has anybody been in a spot where it's been like this, where it's the trickiness of trying to figure out where somebody's at with their faith, the trickiness of trying to figure out what the right words are to say, what the right bullet points are from our creed. If you're looking to share with somebody about their faith or seeing somebody that's even struggling in a way that it seems like they're confessing something other than Jesus Christ is the son of God. Makes me think of this time that I was younger, quite a bit younger, but some Mormons came to our door, apartment I was living in. And I was actually still asleep, if I'm honest, because I did, I don't, I don't like to wake up early morning. It's like nine o'clock in the morning, something like that. But my roommate came and woke me up because they'd asked to, asked my roommate if that, if that thought they'd want to talk to him. And he's like, oh, I bet my roommate Dan will talk to you though. <laughs> <laughs> you can set up. <laughs> So he came and woke me up, but then it became this interesting dialogue because they certainly thought that they were sharing what they thought to be true about the Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormonism. But it really became this opportunity for me. I mean, I think I was maybe 18, maybe 19, of just kind of, in a sense, refuting point by point of walking through with them. Of, And some of it was about setting boundaries of, like, well, let's just stick to the Bible. Let's stick to what God tells us in the Bible rather than the Book of Mormon. And some of it was about terminology and language and working through things. It ended up being these three separate visits. They came back two more times and keep, kept bringing some up, somebody higher up in the, the Mormon church each time I talked to them because the people didn't know how to answer the stuff that I was bringing, pointing out to them. Can I tell a funny about them? Oh, yeah, you can tell a funny, absolutely. <laughs> the, Mormon, the Mormons, you know, were out visiting and Chuck was working in the garage and so yeah. we were talking to him. And I don't know what any of his responses were or what the conversation was. I was in the house and they said, well, we, we'd really like to talk to your wife, too. And he said, oh, you don't want to talk to her. <laughs> he said, why not? And he said, she'll make a loop or not. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't even talk to them. They did not come. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I had a very interesting experience one time. Of, we had a policy, and it was a policy established by the congregation that at funeral services, no eulogies were to be given. The pastor led the service, that was it. If they wanted to make you know, comment about the, what a nice person they were, that was, that was for the reception afterward. And one family insisted that the man who had died with his son-in-law be allowed to speak. So I went to the elders and, I, you know, and they finally said, okay, but he, he, number one, he speaks before the service begins. Number two, he gives you a written copy of what he's going to say. And number three, he does not deviate from that text. So that was fine. So I read through what he said. And then he presented it. And I mean, it was the most marvelous confession of faith I've ever heard. This, his father-in-law led him to, 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 to know Jesus. And I mean, it was just this wonderful thing. After the service, and one of the elders came up to me and says, do you know who that was? I said, yeah, it was Joe Sunderland. Um, do you know who that is? I said, no. He said, he's the bishop in the Mormon church. I went up to him later and I said, do you really believe what you said? He says, yeah, with all my heart. I said, then how can you call yourself a Mormon? You're not a Mormon, you're a Lutheran. No, I didn't mean it. He said, well, I, I don't agree with everything that's, that they, they the, 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 what it means to be a Mormon. Whoa, this is a bishop in the Mormon church. We, we got a Lutheran insider in it. <laughs> yeah, he's infiltrating. Um, yeah, it was just, it blew me away that, that anybody. Well, I'll leave you with this. This is just a couple more scripture passages. And this is, again, just the confession of the world that is, again, is an act of faith. And 
not to leave you with this to beat yourselves up for the times that maybe you have a chance to say something about Jesus and you don't because I've been there too. Um, but just knowing and knowing that God's putting those opportunities for us to talk about who he is in the world and to, to be able to confess who he is to those people around us. Matthew 10, 32, 33. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, I also deny before my father in heaven. Romans 10, this is eight to 10, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and justified, but with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. Again, that's the piece even where you're drawn from what I read from the, cate the catechism. You know, it's, uh, I guess it was large catechism earlier, but the idea that the heart is where you believe, but then with the mouth, that's the one where you, you confess and show that faith that you have. And then finally, Philippians 2, um, 9 to 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The fact that one day, at the last day, a judgment day, everybody's going to see Jesus for who he is, and everybody's going to be on their knee confessing Jesus is Lord. Just depends on whether you, God's drawn you to that faith and you're able to confess that faith this side of heaven on which side, right or left, you're going to be on at that point. But everybody's going to confess it at some point. I love that. Love the fact that everybody, I mean, because he's Jesus and he's awesome. But I should get downstairs. Any other final thoughts before we close for the day? All right. Well, thanks much. See you all next week. So thanks for joining today.